So I think we're getting to the almost the end of the semester. Okay, so um, so uh, what I like always like about the end is um, I'm gonna I can talk about something that's in my subject of area. So my research mainly focuses on air quality. Okay, so if you have anything that's not clear, I know that uh, we're quite limited in time um, to introduce this uh, relatively complex topic here. Um, but I do want to say that we have an emphasis uh, in the, uh, let's say the course is uh, overall is talking about environmental issues, right? And uh, uh, air quality is, uh, I would say it's, it's an emerging issue because it's not like water where we have to drink every day, although the air we're breathing all the time, but uh, it seems as not um, urgent compared to the water. But there are some uh, new research or new findings about how the um, air quality is changing a lot of things. Uh, so for example, last year, uh, we had the, um, um, the wildfires right over the West Coast. So the wildfires generates a lot of um, these toxins, for example, particularly matter into the atmosphere. It's changing the air quality and also the climate in there. Basically, um, it's forming a lot of clouds, right? And then uh, maybe it's also changing the rainfall or the precipitation in, the, in those areas. I think in, in the end of 2019, there's an outbreak of the um, lung diseases associated with e-cigarettes. I don't know if any one of you uh, use that uh, device or if you're using that, just quit it, okay? Uh, because we are also doing some research uh, about um, the aerosols or, or basically the composition of aerosols or part particles generated from those e-cigarettes. And we found a lot of heavy metals. So basically, um, for the FDA, they set up a standard, let's say, uh, for every day, if you want to administer any aerosolized medicine into a human, human lung. For zinc, um, the standard was set at 10 nanograms. So every day, if you want to uh, aerosolize, let's say, um, if you have allergy, you want to generate some nanoparticles to as a remedy to, to uh, heal yourself. Um, the limit was set at 10 nanograms. So any medicine cannot go over that. <clears throat> but we found that for e-cigarette, for one single puff, so one inhale, that's almost 25 nanograms. So, um, which is very, very uh, risky for people to take that. Uh, but of course, you, if you're interested in these uh, research projects, feel free to talk to me. And I would say one thing that's uh, really making the air quality research um, quite outstanding uh, is the COVID, okay? So uh, now we have more evidence showing that the transmission of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus was done by droplets as well as aerosols. So it is airborne, right? And because of that, the air quality indoors is going to be very important. So that's why our school uh, have replaced all our filters, right? To change it to MERV 13 filter, which has pretty high efficiency in capturing those particles. And at home, um, we should use this, uh, those air cleaning devices as well. And for example, if people have to wear masks, it's because the masks can block the particles generated from breathing, generated from speaking and coughing, right? So everything is uh, quite related to air quality. And uh, have to say that we got quite a lot of attention during this pandemic. Uh, because of the research, right? Um, so now I think we can get started. Um, so we're going to continue on the discussion of the uh, air pollution, right? So this is, um, I would say, the second part of the overview regarding the air pollution. Um, so last class, we briefly talk about the definition of air pollution or the definition of air pollutants, right? So we say that the air pollutants are something that's causing damage to human, to plant, to properties, to animals, or to the uh, enjoyment of the uh, lives, right? They are something that's causing this damage, but if we don't know about it uh, yet, so it's also those substances that may be harmful to human 
human health to animal or to uh, properties. If we don't know, if we're not uh, certain about its damage, we can still categorize them as air pollutants. We're going to show some examples on that. Um, so because there are so many types of, types of air pollutants, uh, that's why people chose the most important six of them. And we call them as criteria air pollutants. Okay. So here I'm going to give a quiz about which one of the following is not a criteria or a pollutant. So let's take a look. All right, I'll give it 20 seconds. <clears throat> Okay, five more seconds. All right, we'll stop here. Okay, so it should be the VOC, all right? Uh, if I just write out all the criteria air pollutants again, they will include PM, which is particulate matter, right? And then we have sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and then carbon monoxide, lead, and ozone. Okay, so these are the criteria of pollutants. Those are the most important ones. The reason why we didn't categorize VOC as criteria of pollutant because, is because there are just so many of them, right? And for each of them, we have to find a specific control method. And also uh, in terms of quantity, let's say in terms of quantity, they're not comparable to these species, right? And also in terms of the toxicity. So that's uh, where we design, uh, define these uh, criteria or pollutants, all right? Um, so further within these uh, six air pollutants or six criteria air pollutants, we further categorize them as primary air pollutant and secondary air pollutant. Okay, so we said that the primary air pollutant is basically formed directly from the uh, chemical process. For example, from the coal combustion or the, um, the gas from the engine, right? When we burn the, uh, the gasoline, um, we're going to generate these uh, air pollutants directly. But the secondary air pollutant, for example, the ozone, the ozone is formed based on these prim primary air pollutants or based on other pollutants. For example, in order to form ozone, we have to have nitrogen dioxide or have VOCs. So they have to go through some chemical reactions in the atmosphere and further generate ozone. So basically ozone is not directly formed from the human activities, right? So that's why we can call them as secondary air pollutants, right? So in this class, we're going to give a few examples about how people define or how people um, discover uh, the, uh, the importance of some air pollutants. And then basically what I'm trying to show is that people's perception is always evolving in terms of these uh, definition of the air pollutants, okay? So the first one is about the ozone depletion or the discovery of the ozone hole, right? So this was a very important finding. And uh, because of that, um, there were three uh, chemists, or the three, I would say three environmental engineers or scientists um, co-shared this uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995. And this is mainly because of their work in atmospheric chemistry, particularly concerning the formation and decomposition of ozone, okay? And, and unfortunately, we lost two of them last year or in the past year, okay? Uh, so I think not all of them uh, have passed away. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's quite a big loss to the environmental uh, research field, okay? So now if, we, if you recall, um, ozone, basically O3, that was one of the criteria or pollutant, right? So why would people worry? Or why would people care about ozone depletion? Isn't that a good thing uh, to just deplete them in the atmosphere? 
So basically, uh, whether ozone is doing us a favor or is causing the, the damage to human health really depends on where they're located at. So for example, if I just draw the, uh, our Earth, okay? We have, North, uh, this is Asia, Africa, North America, South America, and Australia. Okay, and now we have the Antarctica again. So we know that people are actually living on the surface of the earth, right? At least most of the people are living on the surface. So what we're inhaling the air, basically the air is just at the very bottom of the atmosphere, right? We have this, we call this bottom layer as the troposphere. So generally the troposphere has a thickness of around five kilometer to 10 kilometer. Okay, so near the polar region, this is uh, almost, I would say around five kilometer and near the equator region, this is around 10 kilometer. So you can see that basically, uh, I would say all of the people, all of the human being, all of the animals are living within the troposphere. So we're just inhaling the air in the troposphere. And actually the ozone in the troposphere is damaging the health, is damaging the uh, respiratory system, is also killing the plants or animals, right? And that's why we call it an air pollutant. But our atmosphere is not only about troposphere. So basically above this layer of atmosphere, there's another layer. which is called the stratosphere. Okay, so um, although um, these two layers are just getting in contact with each other, but they're, the transport of the gas, let's say the transport between these two layers are very limited. The transport rate is very limited. And this is mainly because the stratosphere is generally hotter. Okay, so in terms of temperature, it's warmer compared to the troposphere. So it's basically stopping the transport of the, of the uh, uh, stopping the transport of the air pollutants or the air species from different layers. Uh, yeah. So actually in terms of the ozone, so the ozone in the stratosphere is really doing people a great favor, a uh, great favor. Okay, so the reason behind that is we know that uh, for the sun solar radiation, there are a lot of ultraviolet uh, sunlight in there, right? So the ultraviolet is basically the, the radiation that's causing the cancer, skin cancer in human, right? So we cannot ac accept a high dose of these uh, uh, UV radiation here. But actually in the uh, stratosphere, these ozone molecules can react with this high energy radiation or the UV light, basically the UV, and it's going to generate oxygen and an oxygen radical. And then this oxygen radical can combine with the, um, uh, the oxygen molecule again to form the ozone. Okay, so here I should uh, also write out heat. So basically it's converting this high energy uh, UV radiation into heat well, the ozone molecule is conserved here. So now you see that the ozone is cycled, right? It's just uh, reducing this high energy uh, UV light into, um, uh, into the warmth of the uh, stratosphere, right? So in this way, it's protecting all the lives on the earth. Um, so it has been the case like this until um, I would say industrial revolution. Right, people started to utilize the chemical engineering to basically synthesize a lot of materials that are not existing on the earth. So people found that the ozone depletion is actually happening in the stratosphere. And the main culprit or the major factor that's causing the depletion is called the CFC. So CFC stands for uh, chlorofluorocarbon. Uh, Okay, so chloro means it's chlorine, right? Fluoro, fluorine is, uh, uh, fluoro is fluorine and carbon is C, right? So the molecule generally looks like there's a chain of carbon. 
So we know that for the organics, it's like hydrocarbons. So basically we're replacing the hydrogen with these chlorine and fluorine molecules, uh, fluorine atoms, right? So we're having species that looks like this, right? So instead of having hydrogen here, we're replacing them by chlorine and fluorine. So just by looking at this molecule, we know that it's not something that's happening in nature, right? So the nature is never going to give us species like this. But then you may wonder, why do people generate these uh, CFC, okay? So the major reason behind that is the refrigeration. Uh, refrigeration. So basically to preserve things, right? To generate the cold temperature. So you have to know that um, the formation of the CFC is actually a major breakthrough uh, or a major contribution to the human society near around 1920s, okay? So the major, major reason for that is before the invention of this material, people have been using ammonia or sulfur dioxide for refrigeration. And we know that uh, these gas species, they're very toxic. If you inhale them, uh, you're going to cause lung diseases, right? And it's never easy to, um, never easy to uh, store them, right? And then people realize that the CFC can actually do refrigeration, but what's more important is that it's very stable. Okay, so basically it's inert. It's a gas species. So even if people inhale them into the lungs, it's not going to cause anything, right? So that's why people thought that CFC basically solved a lot of things. And if you check, maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, there are still fridge that's using the CFC as the liquid or as the cooling liquid or refrigerant inside, right? But then actually people realize that the CFC is stable. It is stable when it's existing in the troposphere. But once it gets into the stratosphere, it's causing a lot of damage. So basically what happens is that once the CFC gets into the stratosphere, right? It can react with, also react with UV light. So basically you're going to form a chlorine radical and then the rest of the things, right? So what happens to the chlorine radical is that they are very reactive. They can react with ozone directly to form chlorine oxide and then uh, form a oxygen. And at the same time, the chlorine oxide can react with the oxygen radical. You see that oxygen radical is being produced in here. So there are enough oxygen radicals. So we can form chlorine radical again, and then an oxygen. So if you see this reaction here, right? We're generating chlorine radical, and the chlorine radical is not consumed anywhere in this reaction what happens is that it's going to endlessly convert ozone into oxygen, okay? So basically within the stratosphere, uh, the, the CFC can cause a lot of damage. And as we said, there are limited transport, right? So which means that the CFC is not very easy for them to get into the stratosphere. But if you imagine once one molecule of CFC gets into the stratosphere, they're not going to kill it by any reaction. They're just going to consume um, or, or treat these ozone molecules as endless food, right? You're converting them into oxygen. Well, the chlorine radicals not being consumed at all. So basically this is causing a lot of concern. And um, because of that, um, people have done measurements. So for these three scientists, they have done measurements using the satellite data to monitor how is the ozone concentration over the atmosphere. So we, they basically found something that's very alarming. So here, uh, what is showing is the satellite um, data, um, basically the data captured by the satellite uh, that's showing the ozone concentration in our atmosphere. So you can see that in the year of 1979, you can see that there are some low concentration, concentration regions of the ozone, but I would say almost 30 years later, you see that we form this giant ozone hole, okay? And this is because of the CFC. It's just consuming the ozone um, without any ending, right? And then you may wonder why does the ozone hole is happening in the polar region? 
right? This is mainly because our Earth is always rotating. It's from the west, rotating from the west to the east, right? It's rotating this way, right? So the air near the equators are very turbulent. So basically it's always moving. But once the air gets into the polar region, you can see that as a, let's say a dead corner, a dead spot, right? So the air is not going to transport anywhere. They're just going to concentrate in this region and the same for the CFC. So the CFC is just going to concentrate in here and consume ozone on and on, right? So because of that, you can see that some region in South America and now people living there are exposed to the UV radiation. It may cause uh, damage to uh, human health, animal life, and so on, right? And because of the urgency of this issue, so a lot of countries, I think all the countries under the United Nations, um, they sit together and then formed a protocol that basically tries to ban the CFC. Okay, so, and also they did it, all right? So this is called the Montreal Protocol. Okay, so the protocol says that basically people cannot generate these CFC anymore. We cannot use these materials anymore. Um, and, but people have been tracking the CFC concentration over a long time. So you can see that uh, I, I would say it's quite similar to the establishment of the EPA. So whenever a, a policy is signed, right, you can see a drastic change. So the same thing for the Montreal Protocol. It was signed in 1990, right? So you can see that starting from 1990, all of these, or, or at least one type of the CFC uh, stopped increasing, right? So you, you see this steady or linear increase. And then after 1990, the concentration stopped increasing. But it's not like uh, uh, other gas species where you stop uh, emission and the concentration is going to drop down. So one thing we mentioned is that the CFC is very stable in the stratosphere, right? Nothing is going to consume them. So basically, even if we stop the emission, their concentration is still going to be quite high. And the decrease of this concentration is likely caused by the fact that they are penetrating from the troposphere into the stratosphere, okay? So they're getting leaked into the stratosphere, which means that uh, this ozone depletion is going to happen uh, for a very long time, right? So because the CFC is going, uh, basically they leak into the stratosphere and then they're going to destroy more ozone uh, in there, right? So you can see that our perception is evolving regarding the this chemical here. We thought that it's a lifesaver, right? From the uh, advanced chemical engineering, we found a very powerful material that can improve our, our daily life. And then as our knowledge further evolve, right? We found that there is stratospheric ozone that's protecting us. And at the same time, the CFC can destroy these uh, stratospheric ozone. So that's why we cause we, it leads to the, um, the effort that tries to basically decide it to bind the CFC, bind this chemical, right? So um, that's why the definition of the air pollutant is always evolving, right? So now we can definitely define the CFC as the air pollutant, right? So uh, another one that's quite controversial, but also very important is the greenhouse gas species. So this is the second example for uh, how humans are actually influencing our uh, air quality, okay? So the greenhouse gas species or the greenhouse gas is actually leading to the climate change. Okay, so you probably have heard of another term that's called global warming. So basically, they're talking about the same thing. It's the um, emission of the greenhouse gas species, right? It's causing the, um, I would say the global warming is the, uh, the warming of the average temperature on the earth. And because of that, it's going to cause the climate uh, or the change of the climate at all the different locations, right? So people use this global warming term quite a lot when we first discover this issue. 
But then um, there are people saying that, well, um, it seems that the weather here is not warming. It's still quite cold. I remember, I mean, at least yesterday, uh, Rala snowed, right? You can see that it's still quite cold there. Is that global warming, right? So um, there are cases like these. Uh, basically, it's not, uh, uh, it's not intuitive to call it warming. So that's why we changed to another term that's called the climate change, because it's very rare to have a snow uh, in late April, right? That is a change of the climate. So um, a lot of people actually have some misunderstanding about the climate and the weather, because when we say it snowed, we're talking about weather, right? The weather can be on a daily basis or even hourly basis. If we, if we talk about the tornado, right? It's just developing in hours. But the climate we're talking about in a much, much longer time scale. It's talking about hundreds of years or thousands of years, okay? So you may say that, well, 100 years is too long for me, right? I don't care what happens to 100, uh, 100 years later. But if you just think about human generation, 100 years is, I would say maybe three to four generations, which is not really far from us, right? So we need to still think about this and just uh, do not concentrate on the on the energy or on the, on the environmental issues on, or on economy and the, the time right now, but just also think about what is going to happen a hundred years later, right? So the mechanism or the major reason for this uh, global warming is quite, uh, I would say it's quite straightforward if we know some fundamental physics. So we know that any molecule, let's say uh, oxygen or nitrogen, or carbon dioxide, um, basically they can absorb heat. So they absorb heat because of the vibration of the uh, molecule, right? There are specific um, wavelengths of the energy that they can absorb. Okay, and at the same time, we know that our sun is actually emitting radiation in all the wavelengths. So if I have the x-axis at the wavelengths and the y-axis as the energy, so W, so we, we know that a large fraction of the solar radiation is in the visible range, right? It's giving us the color, right? At the same time, for the shorter wavelengths, we said it's the UV, ultraviolet, right? And for the longer wavelengths, uh, people call that infrared or the uh, microwave, right? So the infrared or the microwave are generally shown in the form of heat. So that's why we use the microwave in our home to warm up, let's say water, or warm up the food. Right, it's because of the wavelengths of that energy. Um, so what happens is that um, our Earth actually gets warmer because we're absorbing the microwave that's emitted from the sun. Okay, so um, we're using this fraction of light or this fraction of radiation to keep us warm. Right. So now you can see that which molecules are actually helping us to keep warm. So the water vapor. It's one of them. You see that water vapor. So here in this graph, the x-axis again is showing the wavelengths. The y-axis is showing the percent absorbed. So basically it's how much percent is being absorbed at this wavelengths. So you see that water vapor is quite helpful in, in uh, making our earth warm, right? So uh, basically it's absorbing light at all different wavelengths. Right, so this is uh, one reason that our Earth is warm, but I think the major reason is because of the uh, what, what they say the black body radiation. So we're so absor basically absorbing all the wavelengths uh, of the radiation that's come and then that's then converted into heat. Right, so um, basically you see that water vapor is one of the greenhouse gas species. It's actually quite effective, but then the carbon dioxide you see that it's absorbing radiation that's not being absorbed by water vapor. But what's more important is that the carbon dioxide can exist in the uh, atmosphere, um, basically at all altitude. So the water vapor can only exist at the surface of the 
uh, of the ocean, right? But the carbon dioxide can be emitted at all different altitudes. It can exist in all different altitudes. So because of that, um, basically, if you consider what's happening on our Earth again, right? The sun is here, right? It's emitting radiation. So the more carbon dioxide we have on our Earth, we're going to absorb more infrared radiation, basically more heat. And then at the same time, since our Earth is trying to emit heat back in the universe, so this layer of carbon dioxide is also going to trap the heat. So this is like wearing more clothes over a person, right? We know that definitely it's going to get warmer and warmer. So that's why we have this term global warming in the beginning. But um, I would say the warming effect will happen if our Earth is just a ping pong ball or if it's just a billiard ball, right? Or a basic ball. Um, but unfortunately, our Earth is not that small. Our Earth is so huge that um, although the average temperature may increase, but the, re the response in different regions of the Earth is going to be different. So for example, um, we know that for our Earth, the North, uh, the North Pole and the South Pole, Pole are generally covered by ice, right? So we know that if the temperature gets warmer, the ice is going to melt into water, especially for region like here. Let's say for region here, right? The ice is going to get melted. We know that the melting process is going to absorb heat because it's releasing the latent heat inside, right? If it absorbs heat, so what people feel if they live in this area is that it's going to get cooler. It's not necessarily getting warmer, right? So because of that, uh, people are not going to have the same perception or the same feeling in terms of the temperature if they live in different region of the world. So that's why, uh, although we say it's global warming, it's not necessarily leading to the warming at any location of the Earth. So, uh, but at the same time, you see that if the ice is melted from the polar region, that's going to definitely cause a, a change in the climate, right? Overall, it's not going to be the same uh, anymore, right? So this is, again, a very um, important issue that people have to face now. And, but what's more alarming is that in terms of the concentration for the greenhouse gas species, and here especially about the carbon dioxide, people have been measuring their concentration for a very long time. So this curve is also called the Keeling curve. I'm not sure if you have learned this uh, content from other classes. So basically this is the measurement of the carbon dioxide concentration in uh, Hawaii, in Mauna Loa uh, Observatory. So the reason why we monitor the carbon dioxide there is because there are very few human emissions, okay? So it's basically measuring the carbon dioxide concentration over the ocean. And there are not a lot of human activities. So if you can imagine, if we just measure it in the city center, then the carbon dioxide concentration will be much higher because there are a lot of cars, right? There are a lot of engine emissions or combustions happening. Um, so because what we're measuring at these relatively clean locations, we can observe, um, let's say, a better or representative uh, state of these uh, of this greenhouse gas species, right? So you can see that starting from 1960, when the uh, measurement started you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration increased almost exponentially, right? So this is stopping at 2019. So actually, if you just search for Keeling curve on Google, you can find the curve for right now, right? So they are updating the figures every day. Um, so I think that a few days ago, uh, there was a Twitter post uh, showing that the average concentration for 2021 actually reached 420 ppm. So it seems that people are not doing anything, although it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very severe issue and we have to face it. There are so many meetings being called, right? So many plans being made, but we never put it into act, right? 
So uh, this is very alarming. This is a, also a very sad problem if we don't just don't face it, right? So if we just further look at this killing curve, you see that there are a lot of zigzags, right? There are increase, decrease, increase, decrease. So these zigzags are actually caused by the seasons. It's not caused by the, uh, let's say the emission over the entire year. So basically what happens when the uh, carbon dioxide concentration decreased was because uh, Mauna Loa is located in the Northern hemisphere, right? It's located here. So when it gets to the summer season in the Northern hemisphere, so the photosynthesis are going to, basically the vegetation are going to absorb more carbon dioxide. So that's why the carbon dioxide concentration decreased. But when it gets to the winter, when all the leaves are um, just fall down and then they die off, right? So they're <clears throat> returning these uh, fixed carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So that's causing this increase of the carbon dioxide again, right? So it's because of the season. But you may also wonder, well, we have two hemispheres, right? It's, if this here is summer, uh, then the southern hemisphere will be winter, right? Uh, but still, they're not going to compensate each other, mainly because the area of the continent uh, is so different, right? So the Northern Hemisphere has much larger area for vegetation. But in the Southern Hemisphere, we just have very small um, area for to grow these uh, grass or these uh, trees, right? We have a large continent in the South Pole, but uh, it's just always covered by snow, right? So these are the smaller features in the Keeling Curve. Um, so, because as I said, there are quite many meetings uh, getting called, and I think that one of the most important thing, uh, most important meeting was the one in 2015, where people called the, where people signed this Paris Agreement or the Paris Accord. So the aim of this uh, uh, accord or the agreement is trying to uh, basically um, to reduce the impact of the global warming, basically to reduce the emission of the greenhouse gas species. So the goal was to limit or the keeping a global temperature rise in this century to well below two Celsius above the industrial levels. So we're not talking about cooling our climate. We're talking about reducing or limiting the temperature increase to below two Celsius, okay? So if possible, we will try to limit that to below 1.5. Um, but I think there was a recent study coming out. So if we just keep with what we have done for the first 20 years of the uh, 21st century, okay? So 20, 2000 to 2020. So if we just keep doing what we have done for this past 20 years, we're going to lead to a temperature increase of four Celsius. That's mm -hmm. Uh, that's also a quite conservative evaluation, okay? Just consider what this four Celsius can do to all the, um, to all the living things on our, our uh, earth, right? So it's glad to see that the, the uh, new administration is trying to go back to the, uh, to the table and go back to the act to limit the emission of the greenhouse gas species. So a lot of people have concerns because carbon dioxide is not like uh, sulfur dioxide. It's not like nitrogen dioxide or ozone, um, which can be limited quite, efficient, uh, quite effectively. Right? We know that those are causing strong harm to human health, but carbon dioxide is not causing a lot of harm. Right? For this concentration, people can still inhale the carbon dioxide. It's just in the long term, it's causing this climate effect. Right? Um, people say that, well, all the economy, let's say combustion, or if we drive our car, we're gonna uh, generate carbon dioxide. If we use electricity, it's related to carbon dioxide, right? So if we just limit carbon dioxide, are we going to see a meltdown or see a uh, decline in the economy? So I would say that we should relate back to the establishment of the EPA, right? So we didn't see any economy decline because of the EPA. Um, we see actually more jobs, more opportunities. For example, for the uh, climate change or, or the uh, greenhouse gas species, uh, we can use 
uh, we can build or use more renewable energy, right? We can use electric cars, although that's not very reliable right now, but people should invest more. Uh, people should learn more to uh, apply these newer technologies. And that's also why uh, we rely on you guys, right? The new, newer generation to solve these issues or to work on these problems. So that as, on one hand, we can keep the economy uh, still going, right? At the same time, uh, we can solve this issue quite effectively, all right? So I would say that this is a, um, these are two examples of air pollutants. Um, so now people call CFC as air pollutant, of course, but I think people are still quite uh, timid or quite reluctant to call carbon dioxide as an air pollutant. But if you just refer back to the definition of the air pollutant, so anything, any substance, that is causing harm or may be causing harm to human health, to the property, to the well-being, that is an air pollutant. So we should call carbon dioxide as an air pollutant, right? And we should limit their emission. Um, so here, I think I have introduced this in our first class. So uh, what we were saying is that not all of the people or the general public are environmental engineers. So if they want to understand air quality, instead of looking at the numbers, uh, people come up with this air quality index, okay? So to show the air quality in number, uh, show, to show the air quality in, uh, in colors and also in more straightforward numbers, let's say the air quality index, right? So there is a way to calculate the air quality index. So if you're interested, uh, you can refer to this label. So basically people measure the concentrations of the criteria air pollutants. For example, the PM, nitrogen oxide, ozone, CO, sulfur oxide, lead. You see that uh, there are some measurements for ammonia as well, right? So based on the actual concentrations, you see that all of them are based on the uh, microgram per meter cube, right? So based on their actual concentrations, you can convert it into the air quality index and also to the uh, different color scales in terms of the air quality. Uh, so if you're interested, you can do some simple calculations here. Uh, we can uh, Now you can understand how your um, smartphone is showing the air quality index from your, uh, just by summarizing all the air pollutant concentrations. So here, what I'm showing is that actually there are quite many EPA stations monitoring the air quality. You see that um, at least in the United States, there are quite many uh, stations reporting these air quality index. You see that actually the air quality in California is not very good. There are a few regions where you have very high concentrations, but in general, the air quality is not bad. Uh, you may say that, well, it seems like there are so many EPA stations. Uh, why don't we just, uh, uh, I mean, this seems quite enough, right? But um, if you just zoom in, so let's say, I think the Missouri, area is probably here, okay? So if we just zoom in, you can find that actually there is no EPA station in central Missouri. Uh, this doesn't mean that there's no people living in central Missouri, that we're living in there, right? Um, so that's why there's also a strong uh, calling on the EPA to basically set, either set up more monitoring stations or uh, you should allow people to use their um, sensors, their smartphones to monitor the air quality by themselves and also to post them online so that uh, all the other people can learn what is uh, the air quality in each location. So this will also involve a lot of efforts, let's say in data science or in a lot of the different subject areas. Um, so I would say that there are still quite a lot of challenges ahead, right? Um, so we can use the rest of the time to briefly talk about the particular matter. So now we're going to talk a little bit more on each of the criteria air pollutants and how do we control them. So the PM is defined as the suspended particles or liquid in the air, right? So it is important because it's one of the six criteria air pollutant. But the reason being, uh, reason of it being the criteria air pollutant is on one hand because of the health effects. Right, it's causing allergy or asthma when we inhale them into the lungs. 
but at the same time, the PM can cause all the different uh, effects. So for example, the particles in the air, they can scatter light. And actually they give our sky a blue color, or let's say during the daytime and give us a, a yellow or red color when it's at sunset. It's because of the particles. So uh, at the same time, these particles can form clouds. So if you just look up the sky and then, uh, and then saw a lot of clouds, they're not only water. So if you evaporate them, there are particles in the center. So we also call these particles as cloud condensation nuclei. So they can form clouds. And we know that the combustion, let's say the wildfire generate a lot of particles, right? The particles, if uh, they exist in clouds, if you have enough of water, then you can cause the rainfall. As we said, it's causing the health effects. And I think nowadays people are also using these particles, what we call nanoparticles, to uh, design these nano-engineered devices. Basically, uh, for example, in the tires, if you drive a car, uh, our tires are enriched in the black carbon particles inside. So basically people will burn the, the fuels to generate black carbon particles and then mix them with the, uh, basically the, the rubber and all the other uh, additives into the uh, tire so that you can enhance the strength. So for example, for the, in terms of cosmetics, uh, for the sunscreen, next time when you look at the, the label in there, uh, you can see that it's mixed with zinc oxide nanoparticles. So it's also particularly matter. Uh, so it's actually affecting all aspects of our daily life. So uh, basically the uh, PM can uh, scatter light. Uh, so here is showing some pictures of the national park. So this is, I think this is Yosemite, Yosemite National Park. Um, so you see that when the particle concentration, let's say PM uh, 2.5 to 0.3 micrograms, you can see very far away. You have a very good visibility. But when the concentration becomes higher, you're going to have this hazy or smoky uh, condition. So the same here, you see. Um, basically, the higher the PM concentration, uh, the more hazy the uh, weather will, uh, or the sky uh, will become or the air will become. It is mainly because of the uh, scattering of the light. So for example, if there are no particles at all between the eye and the apple, right? So you can directly see the light that's emitted or reflected by the apple. But if there are just so many particles, then the light is going to get scattered and then going to all directions. So on a hazy day, you're not going to see that apple anymore, right? And this is also causing the different color of our sky. Right? You see blue sky, you see yellow sky, so in the space, you don't see any sky color, right? It's just black. So for example, in wildfires, people were taking pictures showing the red sun, right? The so red sun is, looks very similar to the sunset. So now I'm going to give the second quiz. I think uh, this quiz question is a little bit late, but uh, let's see, what, why does the sky look blue? Just to check if you uh, have encountered this problem before. Yeah, maybe I have to already tell you the answer when I introduce the last slide. <clears throat> okay, five more seconds. All right, we'll stop here. Yeah, it's because of the light scattering, all right? So the major reason for that is uh, as we said, our sun is enriched in the uh, visible range, right? And also if you check what is the wavelength here, it's basically hundreds of nanometers in terms of the wavelengths. So for light scattering, um, these light is very easy to be scattered by particles within hundreds of nanometer. And uh, what's happening uh, in in our air is that a lot of particles are within this 100 nanometer range. So they can easily scatter the light, right? And then uh, basically the blue sky 
which are smaller in, in its wavelengths, let's say around 200 nanometer, right? The blue uh, 200 to 300 nanometer. So most of the particles are concentrated within this smaller uh, size range, which means that they can scatter a lot of the blue light out of the solar radiation. So that's why we can see the blue color from our sky, right? So the same principle applies for the, um, for the sunset condition, right? So this is about light scattering. Um, and I think that one important um, application of the particles uh, or the PM is its size and also how fast it uh, settled down in the atmosphere. Um, so I think for our next class, uh, I'll depend on the situation, maybe we will have a, a recorded video lecture or a, uh, basically it's a YouTube recorded lecture uh, about the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2, so which is related to this settling property of the PM in the atmosphere. So I'll keep you updated. Uh, we'll see whether our next class will be a lecture or we're going to just use that YouTube lecture. All right, uh, I'll talk to you uh, during the week, all right.